we're live now. Hello, my name is Lorraine King. I'm the editor of The New and Recorder. I'd like to thank you all for listening on our online hustings. I have three candidates here. They're from the Conservative, the Green Party and the Labour Party. And um, they're going to introduce themselves individually. Good afternoon. My name is Kirsty Finlayson and I'm the candidate for the Conservative Party in East Ham. I live in East London. I work in the City of London as a trainee solicitor, specialising in public sector, working for local councils and also NHS trusts. I've worked for two MPs, so I've got quite a lot of experience solving residents' problems. And I've also be become a deputy chair of two London Conservative Associations, which are very, very different areas. So I feel that I have a lot of experience of what doesn't work and what works in councils. My plan for East Ham focuses on three main pledges, getting the best deal for Brexit, tackling antisocial behaviour, uh, especially litter and fly tipping, and finally, championing self-employed and local businesses. I would like to bring fresh energy and fresh ideas and hopefully bring that to your area. And I welcome any questions, thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Chidi Uti Obiara. I am the prospective Green Party MP for East Ham. Um, my background, um, like my colleagues, is also in financial services, but I worked in investment banking for 15 years, and my ties in the area are very strong. They started off in the mid-90s when I sat on the board of the East Ham's Housing Association. This was the entity that helped build the housing bits of the Olympic Park in Stratford. Um, my experience in the area also extends to actually living and having family here. I live in Beckton. Um, it's a spectacular part of London that very few people know about, which comes with a whole bunch of challenges and opportunities that we in the Green Party think that we can contribute to and make better. So uh, our pledges revolve around raising the standards of living for absolutely everyone uh, in the constituency, but focusing not just on housing and employment in the conventional sense, but on the things that will bring housing and employment up to the, the, the levels that we think uh, local people here aspire to. So the pledges that we've made um, in this particular election for this constituency revolve around uh, trying to increase the way that the planning department uh, in Newham deal with new builds, making them more ecologically friendly and environmentally impactful. So we want to see solar panels on new builds, we want to see windmills along the riverbank, we want to see housing that has quality as well as quantity. Um, one of the second uh, most important things that we've talked about are ways that we increase the quality of life of all the people who live here. So we want to try and stop the Beckton stink by speeding up the closing down of the sewage works. Um, we also want to try and shore up the flood defences um, around the Thames Barrier because um, we're being told, and this has not made the national news for reasons that I don't completely understand. We're being told that water now occasionally overflows, um, comes over the barrier. And if this is true, it's a very serious issue that we think we should pioneer and push forward. Uh, half of my constituency sits in the floodplain, the Docklands, and we would be the first affected by this. So we want to push that very, very hard. And last but not least, again focusing on the quality of life for the people in this constituency, um, we are deeply concerned about the way in which City Airport is evolving and the way that it's going to expand. Um, we think that the local authority hasn't been even-handed in the way that it has helped businesses grow. There seems to be one rule for expansion for large businesses like City Airport and another rule um, where rates seem to be out of control for smaller businesses and we think that we would bring a far saner and more thoughtful approach to the finances of New, New York Council. Um, and with that, um, I'm very, very happy to take questions. Hello, Stephen. Uh, I'm Stephen Timms. I'm the Labour candidate for East Ham. I live in East Ham. I've lived in East Ham for almost 40 years and first became the MP in 1994 after four years as leader of the council. Uh, I want to see continuing economic progress in our part of East London. We, we've done well, there's a lot of new jobs, a lot of new opportunities, thanks to the 
dramatic improvement in school standards. We've seen, um, particularly under the policy of the, uh, the Labour government up till 2010, the success of the Olympics, of course, five years ago, uh, and also the success of new and council initiatives like Workplace that have been very successful in getting a lot of people into work who didn't have the chance of employment before. We need to see that continuing. And what happens about Brexit is key to that. If we have a hard Tory Brexit of the kind that Theresa May seems to want, to the extent that she answers questions about anything, that appears to be what she's heading for, um, that will be very damaging for jobs in our part of, of London. I want to make sure that doesn't happen to us. I was elected by Labour MPs in the last Parliament to be one of Labour's representatives on the Brexit Select Committee, and I'd like to continue in membership of that in the new Parliament if I'm able to. I strongly oppose the Conservative school funding formula, which is intended to take money away from London schools in order to hand it out to schools in the countryside. I've got no problems with schools in the countryside being given more funding, but it should not be at the expense of our schools in London. Newham is one of the hardest hit by the Conservative proposals. And I also want to see significant improvements in the National Health Service. And our plan set out in our manifesto is that people earning more than £80,000 should, uh, should be asked to pay a little bit more income tax. That's the top 5% of earners. Not a huge amount, just a little bit of extra tax. That would give us £5 billion a year to bring the NHS back to financial sustainability. Throughout this campaign, I've been hearing about people not being able to get a GP appointment anytime soon, serious worries about the hospitals. There is a desperate need for new investment. That's how we set about achieving it. Thank you. So um, we have some questions here. We did put a shout out on social media, and we do have some questions here. And as um, we said, if you've got any questions, feel free to comment on our Facebook live blog or tweet it at New Recorder and we'd be happy to ask all three candidates a question. So I've got the first one here. Um, a resident has said, what are you going to do about homelessness in the borough? They've never seen so much homelessness in their whole life. So I'll ask you to go first. I think homelessness is something that happens obviously all across London. Um, we've seen it with the financial crisis. I've actually been a deputy chair um, of City of London and Westminster around Vincent Square, which is one of the wealthiest parts of London, you still get really high density of homelessness. I think that's something that can't just be tackled with one thing. So it's, it's about mental health, it's about drug addiction, it's about getting people into, into jobs. They might have um, a lot of mental health problems. Um, so I think that it's not just one one kind of magic answer to it. I think that um, particularly I've done work in Whitechapel Mission, which um, gets homeless people, tries to get homeless people off the streets. And I think that if you if you see what the Conservatives have done in terms of getting people back into work, we've got almost three million people back into work. I think that you need to support that locally. So I think there needs to be particularly in East Ham, more kind of joined up approach between um, apprenticeships and also getting people with the right skills back into work so they don't fall into the trap of homelessness. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. The issue of homelessness is extremely important. I don't think it can be overstated. Um, I think there's a, a, a complex relationship that sits around issues of mental health and poverty in homelessness, but I, I disagree with my my, uh, my colleague here. It, I don't think that homelessness is caused by mental health problems. I think that sometimes homelessness causes mental health problems. I don't think that homelessness can be separated from the fact that the Conservative Party's broad cuts to housing benefits, to expenditure, changing the formula for funding for councils and schools have all contributed to a society where people are so hard pressed that some people fall out of work and eventually fall out of homes. Now, there, there is a, a, a long line of uh, evolving policy that's led us to the place that we are now. Um, and that is that originally, 10 or 20 years ago, the Housing Corporation used to have a grant that it used to give to local authorities and housing associations to build social housing. 
to build housing as a safety net, housing that was designed to help people in dire circumstances for the period of time that they needed it. That grant was cut, it was removed by the coalition government involving the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. And then of course what we saw was that we were told by the, the Conservative Party primarily, but also the Liberal Democrats at the time, that we needed more private sector investment in housing. And there was a boom, it's still carrying on, of uh, giant skyscrapers being built by housing developers who want to sell at market, what they consider fair market prices. But the gap that we have, the issue that sits behind homelessness, is a lack of affordable and social housing. The Green Party is the only party um, that currently stands for the revival of building of social housing, of local authorities actually building homes for people in need, whose poverty rates uh, increased by Conservative Party cuts don't allow them to afford housing at fair market values. Uh, the idea that somehow uh, it, is it is possible to just ignore the policy changes that led us to this particular point uh, is, is abhorrent and basically wrong. Um, we, there is a sort of slither of good news though. Um, the Homes Community Communities Agency, which has succeeded the Housing uh, Corporation, has reinstated the grant and there has been a program of building by some local authorities. Um, the challenge is that new, uh, this particular local authority that governs this part of London has been actually unfortunately a little bit slow in catching on to the fact that social housing is needed in this part of London. A massive boom in private building across all of Royal Docks, the southern tip of, of our constituency. And, and this has to be welcomed. I, I think at the Green Party, what we do recognise is that the politics of, of dividing people into, into competing groups it has not been particularly effective for the past 20 years. It's not what we want to do. But we do need to speak up for people at one end of the, the wealth spectrum who need social housing help. So what I would say is that if you voted Green in this particular election, you'd be voting for the only party that wants to kickstart a uh, social housing revolution across the country. And you'd be voting for an MP, me, who'd be putting the feet of, of, of Newham Council to the fire and forcing them to think about social housing in this borough as a matter of urgency now. As I explained earlier on, even without knowing about the question, I, I sat on the board of the Eastern Housing Association and we, we went out and we borrowed um, money to facilitate building when the grants originally were cut. And of course, Newham um, is almost notorious now for how opaque it has been in the borrowing arrangements it has made with the group of banks. Um, we don't yet know uh, why uh, Newham has borrowed the amount of money it's borrowed um, from banks under the, uh, agreement they call the Lobo agreement, so lender option, borrower option, um, but they've borrowed over half uh, a billion pounds and are paying exorbitant rates and we're not seeing the results. Now, I, I want to be explicit about this and I want to push for this, I want to go into detail on this, but I, I, I can't because... We have a story, we have a question about that, on that, so, coming on up. that very, very So I can issues. hold back and so deal with it as well. That's yeah? not a problem. Okay. But if I could just summarise very quickly, I, I think that there is uh, uh, a need to be very, very clear that our stance on the issue of homelessness is that it's absolutely essential, absolutely necessary to bring back social housing uh, as a solution for that particular problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, homelessness is the most visible and most troubling aspect, I think, of the failure of the government's policy and uh, the result of its austerity programme. That and the huge number of people now need to go to food banks in, in Newham and elsewhere. The, the key problem is the failure of the government to get the house building market working. So house building at the moment is... At the lowest peacetime level has been since the 1920s. We've got to get a lot of new homes built, um, and we've got to get a lot of new council housing association homes built. So uh, the commitment in our manifesto, uh, not just uh, um, mentioned in the Green Manifesto, but anyway, the commitment in our manifesto is 100,000 new council and housing association homes per year by the end of the parliament. I think in Newham, about two-thirds of the council housing stock has been sold off. 
and that's great for those who've been able to benefit, but it means that those homes are not now available for the new families, the young families who need them. And we have to renew our council housing association stock if we're going to provide decent homes uh, for, for, for people. I think we should pay tribute to those who are working to help homeless people at the moment. I'm particularly impressed by the New Way project in East Ham, by Anchor House in Canning Town, which are doing a fantastic job uh, in providing opportunities for shelter at least for homeless people but we've got to be able to provide people with a home and one of the things that really scares me is a number of people I meet now who are being forced not just out of Newham but out of London altogether they yeah. having to go to Birmingham and yeah. Margate because effectively because of the way the government's benefit cap uh, works and what's happening with rents in London and with that, we shouldn't be doing that to people. We need people to be able to make a home where they've grown up, where their family and their friends are, where their work is. And that means a lot of new homes. And Newham Council actually is blazing the trail on building new council homes. They've been very smart. There are quite a number of pockets now of, camp of new council houses uh, in Newham. Big development about to go up um, behind Denmark Arms uh, in East Ham uh, with a council vehicle that will be entirely council flats. Um, but we need the government to get behind councils like Newham that are ambitious for building new homes in order that we can achieve 100,000 a year. Thank you. Um, are we able to go back on this? Exactly. Uh, um, well, let's go through the, the questions that are already here. Yeah, and then it's, it's the same time. question. Sorry? It's just answering the same question, responding to that. The homeless one? Yeah, in terms of what Stephen's just said. Okay. Is that possible? Um, maybe afterwards, once we've asked all these questions, because I don't want to leave out any of the reader's oh, questions. It's time. It's right. time. Yeah, it's about time. So if, we, yeah. if we've got time, we can go back to it. Um, but the next question is what you were talking about, the mm. Lobo loans. Mm. Um, I've got a question here that says, what would you do about the £9 million of dirty debt that RBS and Barclays Bank are holding UK councils to, including the £5 million that Newham Council owes? Um, I'm fairly certain it's more than nine million. Is it nine billion? Billion. Billion. Yes. Yeah. This, this, is the, this is the readers' question, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, no, we haven't fine. had a chance to back check. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. No, you're, you're, it's, it's, a, it's an extremely, extremely important question because what happened in 2008 during the, bank, during the banking crash was that banks were forced to reassess the way that they lend to people, especially when they do so with derivatives embedded in that debt. Because what effectively happened was that lots of borrowers took on risks they had no knowledge of, no understanding of, and simply could not cope with, and the direction of the market changed. Uh, you know, across the Atlantic and here, we've been through a decade of inquiries, we've been through LIBOR scandal, we've been through rate review scandals, we've been through so many episodes where we've been shown that the banking industry was not able to regulate itself in the way that some regulators thought that they they did, and the end result has been that certain types of borrowers have been put at a massive disadvantage. Local authorities appear to be one such type of borrower. And I mentioned this immediately as we talked about the housing crisis because the implications of this are really quite staggering. Uh, I looked through the financial statements that New York Council put out, and between last year and this year, they have rearranged um, the valuation they've given to the lobos they've taken out. And effectively, they now owe the banks an extra 300 million pounds, standing still, with no extra advances to them, just on a revaluation basis. Uh, I, I looked through their flash statements to try and work out where they got this fair value from, and it's not available. The Green Party have written on several occasions uh, to New York Council, asking them to explain to us what the content and structure of these logo loans are. I can show you the papers. It's 90 pages of mostly black ink. It's all been redacted. There's nothing available. When people have asked to sit in on meetings where the council has discussed where this money is going to, how this debt is being accrued, they've been shut out. They've been told that there are councillor-only meetings and that the details could not be disclosed because of commercial sensitivity. We then found out that there were special purpose vehicles offshore registered by Newham Council. We found out that, I, I think this may have been what Stephen was referring to, Red Ventures Homes or something, which is one of a plethora of private companies that are set up by Newham to do what should be public business, 
are the ones who are in charge, apparently, of building homes. We think this is just a wrong-headed way to run a local uh, uh, democracy. You can't have a situation where you borrow on, on these vast scales. Um, you don't disclose the detail to the electorate who are ultimately responsible for paying for that borrowing. You have closed door meetings. You, you find yourself contractually tied in to professionals in the banking industry who have been shown to not be that kind to customers. You have massive bills that you have to pay with no value shown. And then you sit back and you wonder why it is social housing is not being built. Why it is we hear year after year after year that we'll be there next year, we're about to do it, we just need to deal with this debt issue, and then nothing happens. And we're trying to do this in as constructive a way as possible. The, the thing about the Lobo scandal as it stands, that we don't just think it's Newham, so it isn't, it isn't just something that's happening in the East End, we think it's happening across local authorities across the country. But my specific responsibility is the, the, the constituents of East Ham, it's the people who live here, and at the very least, Newham owes them full disclosure. The idea that they've gotten into bed with these commercial entities, they have special purpose vehicles, <coughs> other companies they've registered, and they shouldn't have to discuss their content for commercial reasons is scandalous. It's, it's absolutely wrong. It shouldn't be allowed to stand. So the first thing you do is call for it to be disclosed? Absolutely. Over and above what we currently have, uh, we're being told that the, the tenants of the current DPA and Food Information Act allow them to re redact three quarters of the documents that they've sent through. And there's this horrific situation, I was looking at the financial statements, um, the Treasurer and the Executive Committee um, in Newham are being paid six-figure sums, comfortable six-figure sums, to manage our finances. But they go out and they do things like they get Lobo loans which effectively outsources the treasury function to a bank. The bank decides, they revalue, they decide how much you pay them. When it comes to, re, you know, to, 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 to trying to repay the loan, you go back to the bank for any theoretical fair value they put before you. We have to have oversight of it. We just absolutely have to have oversight of this. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's 23 years since I was the leader of the new council, so I, I can't uh, claim any inside knowledge of the, uh, the councils of council. Um, the question talked about nine million of debt. Uh, of debt. You said it's perhaps nine, nine billion. billion. It's billion. It's billion. I mean, nine. Who, uh, who, I, I, well, they're saying that this person is saying that Newham Council owes five hundred million. Yes. Like I said, we haven't had a chance to fact check it, so we're not sure if it's true. Well, it, it's oh, so half a billion. Well, I, I mean, it's, I, it's, I, I think you know, it, it, it should be uh, the council here answering questions about its finances rather than me. What I would say though is, I it's actually very, much, I actually, I actually very much welcome. Yeah. The imaginative way the council is setting up with Red Door Ventures and others uh, <coughs> building new council homes. The government makes this extremely difficult for councils. They've got all sorts of obstacles in the way, and therefore the council has to be creative in order to get the houses that we you desperately need. Creative. Now, under a Labour government, under a Labour government, of course, there would be support and help for councils like Newham that are, are doing that. Uh, but the fact that the council is building homes, there is a significant number of newly built council homes, good quality homes in Newham, with more to come, I very much welcome. I hope there'll be a lot more uh, following the, uh, the change of government that I hope we're, we're about to, uh, to have. But in, in terms of the details of uh, you know, who the council borrows money from, and that, that really is a question for the, for the council rather than for me. Okay. I'd like to make the point that in terms of housing, there's actually been three times as much council housing being built under the Conservatives than in the 13, 13 or so years under Labour just before the Conservatives came into power under the Coalition. Now, when it comes to actually building those houses, that is up to Newham Council, and I can't tell you um, how the Labour councillors are, are doing their job. I think that it is important in these there is still difficult economic times to use different ways of financing. I think that's very, as, you, as Stephen said, uh, an innovative way of um, dealing with their finances. But in terms of a national approach, there has actually been three times as much council housing being built. And it's, it's something which is, we've got things like you know, an ageing population, we've got more people more living needs. on their own, yeah, and these are things that in the past really 20 years, we've got, we've got more people living on their own, more people divorcing, more, more aging population, and it's not something that's gonna be magically solved. We're trying to create as many, many houses as possible, 
Um, but it's, you know, we, we're aiming to, to meet that target, but it's not something that is just because of the lack of funding of the council. Um, I agree with you that it needs to be more transparent. Um, as a trainee solicitor, I know how difficult it can be when you see all these redacted documents and, you know, is, is an element of disclosure about it. Um, but I think when it comes to, to people having that transparency of the council, we need to know what it is and how they are actually funding the housing. That's absolutely right. Okay, somebody's just coming in with a question which I'm going to sort of, I'm going to, it's going to jump the queue because I think it's a really, really important issue in the borough. Um, it says, given that knife and gun crime is on the rise in Newham, how would you address cuts to the police force? Mm. Also, because there's been the closure of a few of the borough's police stations. So I let you go first. Well, uh, nationally, we've seen a cut of 20,000 in the number of police officers. I think that is... With grace, uh, that should never have been allowed to happen. Theresa May, as Home Secretary, presided over that very big cut. And we need the cut to be reversed. So we've set out in our manifesto our proposal to recruit over the next five years an extra 10,000 police officers. And I think that's the key. Um, some people may recall I was a, a victim of my crime myself a few years ago. and. And what struck me, that was at a time when a lot of young people, and we've seen it again recently, a lot of young people being victims of knife, knife crime. When the police are able to really work hard in an area, work with the young people, get to know the young people, talk to the young people, talk to churches that are working with young people and, and other faith groups and uh, others, then you can stop the epidemic of knife crime. But it takes a lot of work on the ground by the Metropolitan Police. And they can't do it if they are as thinly, as thinly stretched as they are at, at the moment. Um, I think we, we do also need to work with, uh, with, with youth organisations, uh, NASA, the uh, very successful basketball project in Newham, which runs the uh, Carry a Basketball, Not a Knife campaign. That's been really successful and imaginative. Um, there are the, the campaign that the Ark Church in Forest Gate runs, uh, which, is, which has helped them. Those kind of initiatives, I think, are extremely valuable. But in the end, you've got to have the, 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 the police officers who can be on the streets, can be visible, can get to know the young people, work with the young people, build trust amongst young people. And to achieve that, we need to increase the number of uh, officers, reverse the cut we've seen since 2010. Thank you. I think that it's, it's very easy for Labour to to increase spending and a lot of things. Under the Labour government we saw increased taxes, increased spending, increased borrowing and that leads to boom and bust as we saw. I think that Theresa May has had to make some very difficult decisions. There has been some cuts in, in police spending but we're also trying to see ways of um, changing how policing is, policing is met. Um, in terms of knife crime in particular, I think that we need to actually address the root of the problem rather than um, simply thinking increase in policing is going to resolve everything. Um, I've actually worked and volunteered at HMP Belmarsh and I work at Samaritans where I, I actually speak to prisoners and I see um, they tell me why they go into knife crime, why they go into gangs, why they go into into drugs and it's because they don't feel that there's it's a it's a very quick way of making money it's a very it's a very um, easy option for them I think that we need to address the actual the sources of the crime as well um, I think that if Labour's manifesto has a 58 billion pound black hole which has actually been confirmed by an official report and I think that Yes, there are difficult decisions that need to be made when you're, when you're trying to reduce the deficit. The deficit has now gone back to what it was at the time of the financial crisis. Um, I think we also need to look at the fact that with crime in general, the, the police are actually having to address other types of crime which we've never seen before, things like cybercrime, um, particularly when it comes to things like terrorism. They're having to actually have these completely new ways of policing, not necessarily bobbies on the beat. 
And I think that's something that we, we've, had to, we've had to address that challenge in the past 10 to 15 years. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I, 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 I feel very, very passionately about the issue of nerve crime and its prevention as well as cure. Um, it's very important to look at its causes uh, as well as its, its, its operational aspects. But I, I'm humbled by the fact that we sit with, with Stephen, who has actually been a victim of knife crime in this borough. And, 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 and when he speaks, I, I take him very seriously um, because of it. It's extremely unpleasant. It, it, it ends um, uh, scores of lives of young, mostly black men. And so you, you can't uh, uh, ignore the, the, the ethnic element uh, involved. Now, we've talked about policing as of the Green Party in quite a lot of detail, and we've talked about the nature of the interplay between race and policing um, in London. And we've been very, very clear that while we applaud the idea that more policemen are needed from a capacity basis, we think that in the case of knife crime specifically, uh, we have to lay the blame for part of the increase uh, of this in the cuts in community policing across inner London. Uh, there's no doubt that the cuts also in sports centres, community centres, and facilities for, for teenage uh, boys and men um, have, have, have added to a sense in which there is, there is, there is tension, there is unhappiness. Uh, within the context of, of growing poverty and disillusion about the future, young men do turn to less uh, sensible ways of, of trying to make progress with their lives. I say this as though there is an obvious gender bias, but we know, for example, that, that Stephen's attacker was, was female. So we know that the idea that uh, knife crime is uh, an easy way to inflict harm on people has taken root among certain groups uh, in our society, and it absolutely has to be stopped. Now, I agree with, with both of the speakers here. This is a, a long-term issue that needs to be thought about and acted on very vigorously and not just the you know the people who commit the crimes but the causes of the crime so we as a green party have taken a far more holistic approach to this we think that reversing the cuts in community centers sports centers and community policing specifically are absolutely at the heart of the solution uh to, to dealing with 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 with, 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 um, with life crime that, that's our party position and certainly mine as well thank you Thank you. I've um, got an next reader's question here. It says, um, what's the number one change that you think is needed in East Ham as very little appears to have changed? Um, I'll start with um, your turn. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, that's an exceptionally good question. Um, but I have, to, I have to kind of draw a line under the premise that very little has changed and, and, and say I, I don't agree with that. Uh, East Ham is a, a bustling, uh, progressive, part of London that, that has experienced a, a gigantic amount of change over the past two decades, certainly in the lower um, southern part of, of my constituency of, of East Town. The amount of building work that's taking place there, the prospects for expanding City Airport, the change in uh, the use of land uh, around the Galleons Reach area, uh, certainly for the last 20 years, the extension of the, the DLR. Um, and in East Town proper, further up north, Commerce has exploded, despite the fact that on a per capita basis we can talk about poverty with, with grim reality. When you look on the ground at the efforts that this amazing and diverse community are making to fund themselves as small business people, it is absolutely spectacular. My key problem though, because I would change something despite the fact I think there has been a lot of change, I don't think we're being ambitious enough. If you drive through um, Royal Docks and you watch buildings coming up, I repeat, we don't see buildings with solar panels on the roofs. We don't see we don't see wind turbines. We don't even see dust sheets on buildings to protect the people who live there. You know the the the, the people who've lived in Dockers cottages for generations, who, who are properly standards, are being put through a lot of inconvenience by the interlopers who are coming in. People like me who are coming in and buying homes to live live in the borough. We need to have a situation whereby the development that takes place in the borough is sustainable, well thought out environmentally friendly, and most of all, incredibly ambitious for the future. Those are the changes I'd make. Stevie? I really welcome the new jobs coming into New York, including the expansion of London City Airport. I welcome that. Hundreds Shame. of no, extra God, no. jobs, which I'm glad are going
going to be available to young people and others in our community. Um, and of course Crossrail, when that opens in 2018, that's going to bring another surge of development, I think. So in terms of, of jobs, we've made Asian Business Port, big Chinese-led development in the docks, a lot of extra jobs, all that's very positive. But in terms of the appearance, which I think is probably what the question is, is about, I think it's a fair question, I'd say two specific things. Firstly, we need a change of the law so that the maximum amount of money you can put into one of those awful machines in betting shops is two pounds a time. At the moment, you can throw away hundreds and hundreds oh, of pounds. Oh, we're talking about fixed, fixed betting, betting terminals. terminals. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, uh, maximum stake of, of two pounds, uh, and I'm pretty sure that we then see some of those awful shops shut down as a result. Um, and then they, of course, attract a lot of the problems of antisocial behaviour, fly tipping, alcohol consumption on the street, all of those things, which uh, people rightly find objectionable. And um, I, I think in terms of the appearance, it's stopping the dumping of litter, mattresses on the streets, above all, uh, that we need to get to grips with. I really welcome the council work in getting rid of all that stuff once it's been dumped, but we need to stop it being dumped in do, the do first place. Do you think the introduction of charges by the council for removing um, uh, large furniture in people's homes contributed to fly tipping in the back? It was, it was happening on an unacceptable scale before those charges came in, so I don't no. think removing the charges would be the solution. I think, uh, it's, a a com I think it's a combination of things. I think, we, first of all, people need to believe they will be punished if they dump rubbish, um, which uh, the council has now got uh, uh, enforcement officers in, in every ward, that, so that is starting, and I welcome that, and I think there probably is a role in some places for cameras as well to, to watch what's going on. But we also just need to explain to people that uh, if you want to get rid of rubbish, you do not dump it on the street. And I think that the case a, a, a combination of kind of education and also where appropriate fines is what's needed to get on top of that problem. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I agree with the problem. So I would say the number one problem is antisocial behaviour in general and the environment that you know surrounds people. Um, but I would I'd really struggle in understanding this because there's been a Labour MP for 20 odd years. We've had a Labour council. Not more than 20. <laughs> Labour MP. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm only there for 20, but yeah, Labour MP La is long before me. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, but so Stephen in, in, in particular. Um, and the issue, the issue that I have with this is that it's a it's a council-led problem. It's a council-led thing. To, the solutions to this, um, particularly fly tipping and littering, is something that I'm very passionate about, and it's something that can be resolved from fines. So it's actually a money-making thing for the council. Um, if you think of things like speeding, um, a lot of lot of boy races in the area, um, but particularly litter and fly tipping is something where the Conservatives have introduced a national litter strategy, which is increasing the fine for litter and fly tipping. But it's something that actually is making it can make the council money. It has the potential to make the council money. And so it's not something that we can say that oh, it's either the Conservative government, they haven't given the right amount of funds, or it's the council that hasn't got the money for it. Is that something that you can actually raise money to give back to the community? And that's what really frustrates me about things like fly tipping and litter. Um, and there was, there was a case actually reported in the New England Recorder um, a few weeks ago where the, um, the fly tipper actually went to court because um, it was about fly tipping funding his um, addiction to drugs and he actually got off with a fine which was about an eighth of how much Newham Council had actually spent in collecting this. Yeah, we put that story up online yesterday. Yeah, yeah. and so this is something that really frustrates me because I think if the council had got in there you know, earlier and started Finding, the, finding these people, then firstly you create more money for the council, but also that's, you would That's the judiciary letting us down, presumably, if you've got a, a, only a small fine. Yeah, but it's the council... The council is doing its job by prosecuting and taking the yeah. court. We need and that's the laws going, to back up the council's action. Yeah, absolutely, but that's going quite a long way down the line. You can, the council can impose um, fines for littering and fly tipping. So if you've got someone where you, you can see down your road, 
someone dumping a mattress and you know who they are. Sometimes people go to the extent they don't bother um, removing the address from their fly to thing, and that's been something I've spoken to a lot of residents over the past few weeks who've said that's happened to them. And that's something that the council can enforce. There's been a Labour council and they haven't actually got in there before you have to do legal action because there's someone who I've worked with councils in my legal training and it's a huge amount of money taking people to court and as mm. we saw from that, that mm. flight of thing, it's you know eight times as much as, as he's being fined. You can actually get people much, much um, earlier on and the, the real frustration I think that residents have is that it's a money making business it's not just things like fly tipping, but also things like racing. Um, you, you know, you can have speed bumps, which cost very little money compared to, to cameras. But just finding people, it's just so easy, and it's a money-making business. As, as the Green Party member here, the, the idea that I don't get to talk about fly tipping just fills <laughs> me with real horror, so I have to say something, I'm mm. sorry. Um, I, I completely agree with you. I think that from a policy perspective, the cost benefit analysis is just wrong. The idea that... Um, you charge people £20 to take away a piece of, uh, of, of rubbish, they refuse to pay £20, they then fly tip, it costs you £50 or £100 or £1,000 to retrieve the rubbish, take them to court, prosecute them and get a fine that doesn't cover all of that expense. It is just horrific. We need to get to the point where uh, New York Council approaches the recycling of rubbish from a far more intelligent, sustained and even commercial perspective. We already have a massive recycling centre. It can actually be used to create jobs and to create uh, an income for the council if it's properly managed. Again, the, the inability to be clear about these things in inquiries is incredibly frustrating for us. Uh, we as the Green Party feel very, very strongly that there are commercially viable solutions to fly tipping which simply aren't being explored by New England Council. I, I also need to say very briefly, because Stephen must be chomping at the bits for this, we spend a lot of time criticising New England Council, which I think we absolutely must and is right to do so. But Stephen actually, in my opinion, is an outstanding MP. He's been extremely good at a number of things. The challenge we, the Green Party, have with the Labour Party is that you're never sure what faction you're dealing with. There's always the good guys and the bad guys. <laughs> it's extremely frustrating because I, I'm having a real difficult time running against Stephen Timms, walking around everyone saying he's such a nice guy. Well, I really <laughs> like him. And then I spend the next half hour going, my goodness, Newham Council are just appalling. We need someone in there who can shift them up change things. And if, if Stephen would do that, if he would agree to do that, we'd be in a different place. But today he said he supports the airport expansion. He's very happy with Lobo and any other derivative solution that Newham Council decides to go for to fund debt. And that he doesn't see anything wrong with the way they've behaved in dealing with flight tipping. That is wrong. We're watching a good man go down with a bad okay, council. We've got two more questions here. to ask. We've had two more questions coming. And I know time is not on our side, so I've got to watch it to be very brief with the answers. Um, can I ask you first, Stephen, should the Excel Arms Fair continue to be held in East London? Well, I know there are a lot of people who feel strongly about this and uh, oppose the Arms Fair. My view has always been that as long as the arms sales that we're talking about are lawful, and I do think we need more rigorous control of arms sales, and looking at what's happening in Yemen at the moment is a, a good reason for why we do need to be more rigorous than the current government uh, has been. But if those arms sales are lawful and properly controlled, um, then Excel, the commercial operation, of course, can host um, a, a trade fair in that sector or any other. So I, I certainly don't take the view that uh, Excel <coughs> ought not to have a trade fair for this particular uh, industrial activity as long as it's properly regulated and controlled. I'm worried at the moment that it wouldn't. Okay. Do you know what, what would you say? Well, we at the Green Party support multilateral um, disarmament um, across the planet because we think a more sustainable way of helping everyone develop and move forward doesn't involve pointing nuclear or other weapons at each other. And because that is our position as a party, the idea that my constituency should be the one in which um, uh, rogue states and uh, uh, unethical arms dealers get to meet and chat for lunch makes me unhappy. I'd rather they held it somewhere else, uh, another continent maybe, or perhaps a different planet, I don't want them here. I'm sorry, that's how I feel about it. Thank you. I, I partially agree with Stephen on this. I think that um, it's very important to have that 
commercial hub in Excel. Um, I think it's very difficult from an ethical point of view of, of trying to distinguish which fairs take place and which don't. Um, so I think that as, as long as is ev everything is lawful, I think that it would be very difficult um, not to continue to hold it. Um, but on the subject of guns, something I would like to address very quickly because I'm sure that the other candidates have also had lots of emails about fox hunting um, and um, shooting in general. Lots and lots of emails have come in on, on fox hunting. Unfortunately, it's the one conservative policy that I'm very against, so I've always been very, very open about that. Um, I consider myself an environmentalist and probably agree with a lot of things that you <laughs> agree with as well. Um, animal welfare is one of my key priorities, so in terms of guns and that, that aspect of guns, um, I'm, I'm extremely against fox hunting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, we've got one more question. Um, I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, what impact do you think the proposed changes to education funding will have on schools in Europe? Well, um, in terms of funding, we've got more. We've got over a few two hundred thousand um, more schools which are rated outstanding or good since two thousand and ten. Um, in terms of the direct impact in Newham, um, I think that it's it's very difficult to um, know how like the actual spending per pupil, um, but I think that you have to take into, into account that we have been trying to reduce the deficit. There are going to be very difficult decisions. Um, myself, as the candidate for the, the government, I'm always going to have to um, defend the spending. Um, but I think that, you know, that th these are very tough economic times. Um, it's difficult to um, say that we're going to increase spending like the Labour, Labour Party. They have got a £58 billion black hole in their manifesto. I know that they, they want to increase spending for schools, um, but you have, to, you have to make very difficult decisions. Okay. What do you say? Um, office, can I push again, please? Um, what impact do you think the proposed changes to education funding will have on schools in Newham? Um, I think it will have a, a poor impact. Um, we, we, we know that um, the, the, the current Conservative Party manifesto talks about taking away school lunches um, and replacing them with, with seven B breakfasts at the primary school level. Um, and and it's, it's that sort of switching um, within the education budget that we at the Green Party basically disagree with. Uh, our, our manifesto uh, pledges, uh, we call them Green Guarantees, talk about increasing funding to schools so that they can reduce school sizes. But there is something that is, is troubling for me within the context of um, the borough's own schools and the impact that the funding changes are going to have. It's that despite a spectacular record of success, a, a huge increase in the number of schools rated as good or outstanding in London, uh, instead of copying uh, the model, instead of keeping uh, the existing uh, funding uh, uh, policy that has served it so well, uh, Theresa May's government is proposing, if they're allowed to return, um, next time around, to take a hammer and chisel and any other large implements they can to that exact system that's been so successful. The Conservative Party carries out, you know, apparently, you know, underneath the radar, but this time around they've been spotted from a far way off and they really should not do it. We do not need to play politics with the lives of small children. We don't need to, to, to increase class sizes and reduce the amount of food, lunch. I mean, Margaret Thatcher was known as the milk snatcher for her strategies in the 1970s, and Theresa May, determined to outdo her in every way, is snatching lunch instead. It's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Thank you. Uh, it, it is wrong, uh, and uh, as we've just heard, it's, it's absolutely what the Tories are doing is taking the money away from London to areas where they think people are more likely to vote Conservative and, and giving the schools extra money there at our expense. I, as I say earlier, I've got no problem with schools in rural areas being given higher funding, but not by taking it away from our schools, Correct. who are doing now, thankfully, a very good job, and all of that is being put at risk by... ...meals because he said the Conservative Party was committed to free school meals as well as the, uh, 
the other uh, coalition party at the time. Now Theresa May is doing a U-turn on that, and all that investment potentially uh, is going to be thrown away because the commitment that Michael Gove made is being torn up. I, I think that the, the whole way that schools are being treated, particularly schools in London, by the Conservatives is absolutely shameful. And, you know, we've got to do everything we can to stop this formula being implemented and our young people paying up the price as a result. I'd just like to make a point on that free school meals. There, there's been a lot of research done on this, on, and at the weekend in newspapers, various reports, teachers are saying that, that actually the lunches There is no way the Conservative Party sat down and decided to switch uh, to a, a 7p lunch rather than a one or two pound, sorry, a 7p breakfast rather than a one or two pound lunch because they were really thinking that kids would like to have a cheaper meal. Uh, that, that, that wasn't the thinking behind the, the, the policy. The thinking behind the policy was to cut funding for kids who need it, uh, for meals that are needed in the inner city. That was just one of those switches within policy that people see through now. It's, What's wrong? Right, unfortunately, we have, to, we have to end now. The hour has gone far too quickly. Um, I'd just like to thank you all thank for, you. for coming in. Thank you very much. And um, if you just tell the electorate very quickly in one sentence okay. why they should vote for you each. We've been discussing. Uh, instead, we need a properly funded, properly supported health service. We need the, the, the schools to be invested in, not to cut back. And we need a, a whole uh, raft of new opportunities for young people, encouragement to, to stay on in education and to study, and then the opportunities to move into a, a successful career afterwards. Those are the opportunities that a Labour government will bring. Thank you. Well, thank you all for tuning in, and I'm sure we'll be back sometime, probably during the count, we might do some Facebook Live there. We'll all interview, we'll interview you all. Thank you. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah.